Welcome back, Force listener, to this special rewind presentation of a Gen X grown up backtrack. I'm John. Here with me, of course, are Mo and George. Hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? There you are. How's it going? <laughs> so, in this rewind, we are looking back to, let's see, this is August 2018 when we talked about the movie rental store experience. Oh, yeah. Oh. What a Gen X touchstone oh. this thing was. So ripe for discussion. Yeah. I, this this is probably one of my favorite episodes we did because this there was so much to talk about and it was such a big part of growing up, sure. going to store mm -hmm. and we you know and, and discovering stuff and I, I just really had a blast. I remember having a blast doing this episode. The, the discovery that's a huge part of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Being the youngest of the three of us, I feel like that this was the time period in my life where I grew into a little bit more independence from my parents. And the video rental store was the place where I got to go and do my own thing, pick out my own stuff, take it home, mm -hmm. and everything. That was that felt more mm -hmm. like I was becoming an adult, and I think that's why mm -hmm. I loved this topic so much. And I think we talk, I'm pretty sure it's this backtrack. It's been a while since I listened to this one in particular, but like we talk about the fact that it was a distribution method. Like right now you have these major distributors of what's going to be on streaming and what's available. But these are, some of these are mom and pop stores. We talk in the show about mom and pop and big chains, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. somebody could just walk in a store and go, look, I'm a distributor. I got these 10 weird B movies. Yeah. Will you put them on the shelf? And you can discover amazing stuff. Yeah that doesn't require some big industry to decide it's something I'm going to watch. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something we're lacking with all the streaming services is that you just oh, yeah. really, you only see like a very small, you know, Netflix, mm -hmm. tons of movies, but we only, you only see a very few and it's really hard to search for something. That was that documentary yeah. that I just watched about, you know, the old theaters that are still trying to stick to original film as opposed to digital. With, with the 35 millimeter. Right. Yeah. Old yeah. Stuff mm -hmm. is not being converted over to digital. Those old B movies mm -hmm. and stuff that are really great mm -hmm. and have yeah. this historical places to you know they're just not getting converted over and it's a, it's a damn shame and you never saw a video rental store say oh we've lost the license to rent this right all the time right. like netflix <laughs> and hulu are pulling stuff off the library once they have the tape they can rent it for the life of the yeah. tape yep. mm. yeah all right hey fourth listener this is a great one i think you're going to enjoy this so without further delay let's get into this rewind presentation of movie rental stores hope you enjoy it Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Welcome back, Gen X Grown Up Podcast listener, to this backtrack edition of the Gen X Grown Up Podcast. As you know, it is the episode between our regular shows where we take a single topic from our memories growing up as Generation Xers and dig in deep. Joining me as always is Mo. Hey, everybody. And George. How's it going, guys? In this episode, as you know, we teased in the last show, we are talking about movie rental stores. Oh, yeah. One of those cool things that was around for everybody, and now they're almost entirely gone. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy? kind of a dying thing now, right? Mm -hmm. I think really? we mentioned a couple shows ago, the very last blockbuster is uh, open somewhere in Oregon. And yeah. beyond that, there's no more of them. Yeah. And that was the powerhouse. We did a topic sort of related to this a while back, right? Right. We did a whole backtrack early on in the series about VHS, which, of course, was the commodity that they were uh, initially hawking in these movie rental stores. And we talked about the experience of getting our first VHS and you know, what we remember watching and how we recorded and tried to copy movies and stuff. <laughs> but we want to take a, a show and just focus on remembering the rental stores themselves, you know, the yeah. origin of them, how they evolved and changed, how they affected other stores and their business models, and then eventually what killed them. Without <laughs> so, VHS, there would have been no genesis of rental stores because on a, they weren't going to rent 16 millimeter film or anything like that. But there just wasn't a model to give that to customers. Without that plastic square cassette, whether it had been VHS or beta, either one, you, you couldn't have done what they did with these stores. It wouldn't have been possible. The yeah. other stuff was too easily destroyed. It didn't have any protective cover. So mm -hmm. yeah. the cassette industry started what became the video rental store. That paved the way, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it starts with a mom and pop store. And you'll remember VHS made the pricing model. So when movies first came out on VHS, mm -hmm. they were prohibitively expensive for an independent viewer to buy. They were a couple hundred dollars, $300, $500 for a copy. Yeah, they were crazy. And that was certainly on purpose. The movie industry wanted 
those prices super high because they didn't want you watching them over and over again at home. They wanted you to go into the theater, paying for a ticket after a ticket after a ticket, buying popcorn after popcorn after popcorn. That's mm-hmm. what they wanted. So these little mom and pop stores started cropping up and saying, hey, we can afford to front the cost of buying these expensive tapes. And what we'll do is we'll start renting them out to individuals for a few bucks. We'll recoup our costs and help out. Well, turns out that was a phenomenal <laughs> idea. <laughs> they did more than just recoup their costs. Oh, yeah, for sure. And as I recall, the studios, they were very much against rentals. They tried to fight them, I believe, right? Oh, yeah. was, uh, they were like, they oh, you can't do that. The you bought them. Business. Right. You know, and it turned out, you know, copyright was such that, no, I bought it. I'm not publicly viewing it, which is what they prohibited. As long as I'm not copying it, there's only one right. copy in existence. I can rent it out. They ended up winning that. I would say that pretty much laid the groundwork. Once the mom and pops took the brunt of the force the studios, big chains started going, you know what? This is a business model. It's not just something you're going to pick up in addition to bread and milk at the corner store. This is going to be our model. And then the giants came out of that. Yeah. Just to go back a little bit on the history, I did some quick little Wikipedia oh, did you? research. What would you find out? So check this out. I was completely wrong. What did I say? There's no way you're doing 16 millimeter film, right? Okay. The very first business that rented out copies of movies for private use was opened in Kassel, Germany in the summer of 1975, and they rented out films on Super 8. Wow. There you go. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) Just a couple of years after that, in 1977, the very first movie rental store opened in the U.S., and of course, it opened up right in the heart of Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard. In Hollywood. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) I don't know. I doubt that the guy in Los Angeles knew the guy in Germany, so you know, it was probably one of those shared (laughs) global idea kind of situation. They're buddies. Yeah. But, you know. but that just goes to show you how right around that time was when people started thinking, you know, I'd like to watch this at home. He's like, you know, this Super 8 rental in Germany is going great, pal, who lives in California. Maybe you want to <laughs> kick it off over there. Yeah. Wow. I mean, so it's crazy to think how it went from those two little kinds of stores into what you're talking about, John, with the big chains mm-hmm. that started popping up after that. Yeah. So the ones I remember, I mean, there were different big ones. I mean, the biggest one probably is Blockbuster, maybe, arguably. I, I would say, yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. knows Blockbuster. That's like like synonymous when you're talking about movie rental stores, the first words that people say are blockbuster. Right. I mean, yeah, like movie gallery was one I remember, family video, mm-hmm. some others probably, right? Some of the other stores kind of started doing that later, but those were the ones that I remember starting out as movie rental places. I mean, growing up in New York, they didn't really have like, other than blockbuster, pretty much all the video was all mom and pop. There's very, very few chains. Is that because of the size of the stores and the limited space in New York, you think? Limited space. And plus, I mean, you didn't need like a ton of space. But you remember back in the day when they first came out, they would only get like a couple of copies of each movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so everyone's racing to get there and reserve movies and and all that stuff for for the new releases. Right. So, you know, you didn't need a ton of space. You know, as long as you got like the the really popular stuff on stock. With these giant chains then, I mean, they were cropping up. I think Blockbuster, we, George, you found it was like an 85 was when the yeah. Blockbuster started coming out. October 19th. Yep. The heyday of these big super chains and really the heyday of video rental was kind of the mid to late 80s and, and most of the 90s, I guess. Before Movie Gallery and Blockbuster died, as they've just about done today, (laughs) they were the Facebook and Microsoft of the world. Everybody had a card. Everybody rented their local Mm -hmm. store. So let's talk about they are the kings of the kingdom. Because it was such a large phenomenon, it was ingrained in the culture of other things that were on our TV and in our films. Those Mm -hmm. of you who remember... One of my favorite films of all time, Clerks, that takes place in a convenience store that's attached mm-hmm. to a video Movie rental, rental store. Right, of course. And, you know, those two guys who are best friends, one of them's the guy who runs the video store, the other guy's the one who runs the convenience store, and they have, you know, a day in the life sort of scenario. And there's been several other films and TV shows that have referenced those. Oh, yeah, right. Sure. I mean, we'd mentioned before when we were talking about the Be Kind Rewind, that Jack Black film, which mm-hmm. was took place yeah. in a movie rental store and he accidentally demagnetized all the tapes and remake them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite films, um, the Fisher King, 
which is one of Terry Gilliam's films with Robin Williams. Yeah, oh, you're right, um, right. She owned a video rental store. Yep. Yeah. The point that you're making, George, I think is just, you know, like a grocery store or a coffee shop or a restaurant. It just, it became a setting. It's like an improv. Like if somebody shouts out, give me an emotion, sad, give me a location, movie rental store. It just, it becomes right. a place. Everybody yeah. has a common baseline. They know that place because everybody has been to one. Yeah, it's, it's part of the common consciousness. Yep. And Blockbuster, as huge as they were, I mean, they were big, like huge companies like your, your Microsoft or your, your Doritos or something. I mean, they were hosting like football bowl games and stuff. It, wasn't there one? Yeah. Yeah. There, the Blockbuster Bowl, it was actually in Miami. It's now the same bowl has been renamed to Camping World Bowl and is played in Orlando. Oddly enough, for John and I, we have kind of a tie to that first Blockbuster Bowl. The very first game was played with Florida State and Penn State. Mm-hmm. And we're Florida both State Florida alone. State guys. So, yep. yeah, Blockbuster was everywhere. I mean, they were anything that needed advertisement. They were promoting everybody. Their commercials were everywhere. It was crazy. Now you're saying Blockbuster is no longer hosting that bowl? <laughs> I mean, Blockbuster had a blimp. Remember the Blockbuster blimp that would fly around? The Blockbuster blimp. That's right. Yep, That's absolutely. Right. So they're on par with Goodyear we're talking yeah, about. They were monster. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were honestly, everybody's like Goodyear. That can't be that big company. Well, they provide pretty much every tire in the world. You might think it's a Firestone. It's really a Goodyear, you know, under its course, kind of like rebranding the same thing. But as big as Goodyear is, there were times I remember when there were blimp battles at different major sporting events like the Super Bowl or a giant concert. And those two companies would fight back and forth for the rights to have their blimp over that event because, of course, the event would talk about that blimp several times during the event. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And, and they had shots of it. Yeah. started beating Goodyear a lot of times. Beating them out. Of course. Let me tell you, though, it's like I still remember going to a blockbuster. Like if you tried to go there Friday afternoon. Oh, my Lord. Oh, yeah. It was just it was slammed. Packed. It was just yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah, just totally slammed. Movie rental stores were writing their own ticket. They were printing money. It was yeah. they could not yeah. lose. There was no end in sight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess there was eventually, but <laughs> right. the video movie rental industry. One thing that they brought around that I still stick with today through the comic books is the new videos always came out on what day? On Wednesday? Oh, no, Tuesday for videos, right? Tuesdays. Yep. Tuesdays always when they came out. So, you know, like you say, Friday, you go there and everything was gone. That was because guys like me would go there on Tuesday and keep it for the whole week. (laughs) Because remember, Blockbuster, they had the tiered rentals at one point. Ah, So George is part of the problem. Three days, five days, seven days, all that kind of stuff. In theaters July 28th. Welcome to the Haunted Mansion. You ready to have your mind blown? We have 999 happy haunts, but there's room for more. We could be trapped here for eternity. There's no turning back now. Madam Yoda, we need your help. I can show you, but it will cost you three dollars. What? Tyrant robbery. Who said that? Disney's Haunted Mansion. Ready PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Only in theaters July 28th. Get tickets now. Imagine the perfect video store. It would have a great selection, right? Right, over 10,000 videos. Three evening rentals, so no rush, no hassle. Fast checkout, 24-hour quick drop return, open late every night. Well, the perfect video store... Welcome to Blockbuster Video. ...is popping up all over the country. And it was such a hit that nobody's going to ignore that. You know, I mentioned that this started impacting other businesses. Everybody said, I want a piece of this gravy train, right? Mm -hmm. So the other stores started copying uh, what video rental stores were doing. So if you went to your local, uh, like, record store, like a Turtles or a, they're renting videos. Yep. The grocery stores would start renting videos up in the front, you know? You're like, well, you can buy stamps, you can get your lottery tickets. Oh, and you can rent videos up here, too. Yeah. Because it's like printing money. You buy one copy and you remonetize it over and over. I mean, we owned a grocery store and my dad was talking about wanting to rent movies at that store. We just ended up not being able to do it. That was even on his mind and he couldn't press a button on anything other than a regular remote, let alone a VHS tape. <laughs> they were everywhere. Well, let me tell you, one good thing that kind of came out of the whole video revolution was um, this is from my family because my mom is Korean. I have a lot of Korean relatives. You started seeing movie rental places for different cultures. Oh, good point. That's right. So oh, New York actually yep. would have a Korean movie video store. No. Never considered that. But of course, obviously they would. Right? Chinatown had Chinese ones, so you could rent China- movies in Chinese, um, which before that stuff just never existed. Mm. Yeah, and, and that makes sense because they were trying to s- serve that underserved market. They couldn't go to Blockbuster and find a yeah. Chinese language film on the Blockbuster shelf because Blockbuster was all about middle America. They could go yeah. – 
to that local place that imported the stuff from Hong Kong or wherever and get the films for their culture. That's cool. Yeah. That's really neat. Yeah. Do you remember like going to the video rental store, which to me was similar to going to a bookstore? Because you go there without anything in mind and you would browse all the shelves and, and really it's like cover art caught your eye more than anything else. <laughs> or so so right? was in this. Let's talk about that whole experience. Yeah. Uh, so we've set the stage. We've talked about, you know, how it started and how movies were expensive and that's why these kind of spawned and we got the giant mega chains. But let's get down to the nitty gritty. It is Friday afternoon mm-hmm. and you're like, I'm on the way home. I want to rent something. For me, before I even got there, sometimes you end up knowing a buddy down at the store. I would call up and go, do you have any copies (laughs) of Big Trouble in Little China? Do you have, you know, do you have it? Or first, right now, there's no consideration of do you have it? It's all streaming. Right. Everybody has it. You can all watch the same movie on the planet at the same time if you want. But maybe they have it. Maybe they don't. I'm going to watch something. You stop by the store, walk in the front door. What's our experience? What's it like? I We had a local chain here in Tallahassee before we had the Blockbuster. So we had a chain called Video 21, Uh which I never understood where the 21 part came in, but they had probably between two and 400 tapes in each store, about three or four stores around town. And I remember specifically, there was one right next to our local grocery store, which was a Publix that my mom would shop in sometimes. She would go to Publix and she would just kind of let me walk over to the video store. And so I was hanging out in the video store much in the same way that I used to hang out in an arcade when we would go to the mall and she would want to do her shopping there and she would leave me in the arcade. I was doing the same thing at the video rental store. I got to know the guys who worked there and the owners (laughs) and the managers and everything. So they yep. were really cool. They would keep stuff back behind the counter for me to make sure that I could rent it. I'm just like Mo. I remember heavily though being influenced by the box art. Mm-hmm. Those covers they could sell a really crappy movie just if they had a good box cover. (laughs) With either creative or provocative Mm -hmm. or a crazy looking box. You you put an insane clown with a bloody axe and it might (laughs) be the worst schlock (laughs) ever. I'm like, ooh, I want to see what's up with the insane clown, you know? (laughs) You know, for me, it was all about martial arts films back in that era. So if you had a ninja jumping in across from one side or a throwing star, you know. Who's got a good pose and there's a flame coming off his foot maybe yeah exactly sold. <laughs> yep. i didn't care what it was i was renting it you know you talked about your uh, video 21 you wonder if the 21 stood for uh, the movies they had behind that beaded curtain uh, oh, <laughs> you know they did have one of those at rooms and i was fascinated with that room because you'd you know when you're under the adult age limit right you're kind of well, tell us why george you, well you know you're you're under the adult rental which video 21 but adult was 18 so i think you could probably rent at 18, but I'm not sure. You kind of walk over and they would always put a section near the beaded curtain that was nothing a young male would want to be in. Like it was the drama uh, chick flick section next to the beaded curtain. So they knew Mm -hmm. we had no business in there looking at like 16 Candles or (laughs) whatever John Hughes film would come out that week. But we would be over there like intensely studying it and then you kind of start to side glance out the left of your Mm -hmm. eye to look over. The beads were, you know, they were just separated enough to tease you, but not enough that you could really see anything. Every now and then you kind of like brush your shoulder against it, see if the clerk would hear the beads (laughs) rattle or not. Man, it was like a little game of cat and mouse almost. I'll admit that I made a lot of slow walks between drama and documentary, (laughs) accidentally (laughs) peeking in between the beaded of the beaded curtain. So now you're a huge documentary fan. (laughs) (laughs) It worked out. I I love documentaries now, as it turns out. (laughs) We've talked during the VHS episode that the thing that made VHS the clear winner was the porn industry. And once they won, it was because of inexpensive distribution. Mm -hmm. And those video rental stores... Now, the big chains, they tended to always shy away from that or sometimes shy yeah, away from that. But the mom and pop stores, yeah. it was. I would bet it's their bread and butter. Yeah, some of them. Those are movies you might say, come back and, and rent again and again because you're not watching it for the plot. <laughs> <laughs> you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I'm fairly sure that Blockbuster didn't carry. They had a rule about not carrying anything with an X rating, which if I remember right, uh, Urban Cowboy ran into right. some trouble about not being carried in Blockbuster. Yeah, there are a few films that were, you know, art films or whatever that just got that rating for whatever reason that ended up getting negatively impacted because they wouldn't get carried. It's like an album with too much explicit lyrics not being carried in Walmart mm-hmm. today. You know, it's You're like, right. well, I might actually consider my artistic integrity to make sure that my 
media can be carried in the big chain. So yeah. they had influence back. Talk about the experience though of going into one of these places. Like for me, I mean, it was I could tell you how many times it was like I was married at a time and be like, hey, let's meet the blockbuster. Oh, really? If somebody was late, where that's it was. okay because <laughs> you're browsing. You know, you're browsing. So you're not, mm-hmm. you don't really care if someone's a little bit late. You're not killing time. Yeah, yeah right. you always got something to do. Like I said, it's always kind of going in there. You you have like the movie you really want, and then there's the movie you actually left with, right? <laughs> Which was never yeah. usually the same thing. Yeah, true. <laughs> and often I ended up with too many movies. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, well, I I went I wanted to see this one. I wanted to see this movie, so I got it. But I'm like, oh well, they got like a if you rent three, yeah. there's a deal. <laughs> yeah, you know, or, or I so I ended up walking out with a, a stack of movies, maybe five movies, and I'm like, the weekend is only so long, and I ended up not watching everything <laughs> I think I'm going to watch. And I remember too that first the first. Blockbuster that opened up here in Tallahassee, I remember it being set up in that very 80s neon garish style. Originally, really? they had the, yeah, they had the neon <laughs> around the outside of the building. Very day kind of look like a cinema almost, right? Yeah. And they, you know, right. all the yeah, props they're trying to invoke that thing. feeling. Remember they had the popcorn in the buckets that you could microwave when microwave popcorn was I was just was about to say, later thing. they really tried to invoke the theater experience. You could get yeah. milk yeah. duds, Overpriced you could candies. get popcorn, you could get snow caps <laughs> and all the stuff. That, I could get my goobers there. That was something I couldn't yeah, find stuff in a that lot of almost places. exclusively yeah. showed up at theaters they would have in the front. Go, hey, going to watch a movie on your 13-inch CRT. You're going to want popcorn. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> So, was trying to replicate the experience. Yeah, they did a really good job with that. Uh, when I worked in shoe stores and managed them, it was always the accessory sales is where the profit was, right? You'd sell the shoe mm-hmm. and you make a, some money on that. But if you could sell the shoe laces, that was like a 90% yeah. profit margin. So they did the same right. thing with those snacks and stuff. It was crazy. Twizzlers well, and movie candy. Twizzlers were everywhere at Blockbuster. And what a no-brainer a movie candy, because how much does snow caps cost at a theater? Well, it costs $17 <laughs> for a box mm-hmm. of snow caps. Right. So if they sell it, if they're your you're selling it for three bucks. You're like, what a bargain. Yeah. When really, it's a you know 20 cent box of candy, but it feels <laughs> so cheap there because I'm used to paying the five, six bucks for it. And because they had you in that mindset of movies and movie theaters and everything, you're walking in and you're like, well, I'd like mm-hmm. some popcorn, but I don't want to have to mortgage my house. Oh, wait, it's yep. only $4 no. a bucket. And it's really yeah. like Ooh, 12 cents yeah. worth of popcorn. Of course, but it's cheaper than the movies. Of yep. course. Yep. Absolutely. Bruce Martin, host of Pit Pass Indy. Each week, I go behind the scenes of the NTT IndyCar Series and introduce our listeners to the biggest stars of IndyCar, which features the Indianapolis 500 as its cornerstone event. The men and women that compete in IndyCar may be the bravest athletes in all of sport as danger lurks around every corner. They are able to look danger in the eye without flinching. That is why the NTT IndyCar Series features the best racing on the planet. Join me every week as we talk to the stars of IndyCar, including the legends of the Indianapolis 500 on Pit Pass Indy from Evergreen Podcast. Right now, rent the movies of your choice for only $2 per movie per day. That's right, $2 per day. Hundreds to choose from, including Raging Bull, Ordinary People, Airplane, Coming Home, Fame, Superman the Movie, The Jazz Singer with Neil Diamond, or many other great movies on video at only $2 per movie per day. Where at the warehouse? Why not see the movies of your choice at home tonight? What about the bane of the movie renter's existence? Oh, Come God. back, rewind, return your movie, yep. you're out looking for the next movie, and the guy goes, hey, hey, Mo." You didn't rewind this one. Uh, <sighs> Again? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I swear I rewound it. Yep. And not only that, but that was such a horrible thing. They actually built specific devices just to rewind the tapes. Oh, yeah. I had one. Yeah. yeah. A VHS rewinder. Mm-hmm. Because it's such a first world problem. Right. I don't want to sit and wait for my VCR to rewind my tape because I can't watch another tape while that's happening. <laughs> so I'll eject it, put it in a new special machine that just rewinds it so I can go ahead and get started so on this second the tape. other movie. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, there's obviously time to rewind it. Even if you got to go to the bathroom and come back, it only takes like 45 seconds. But oh, no. 
<laughs> it seemed a lot longer. And what if you did rewind? I know that my movie store, there would be a fee charged if you yeah. didn't rewind. They would charge you yeah. extra if yeah. you didn't rewind it. Yeah, it was, it was like 50 cents or a dollar or something. Something like that. I don't know, yeah. but it was enough to hurt. It was enough to sting. And you're like, all right, we'll rewind it. Yeah. yeah. And they had like a bank of those rewind machines there. Yeah. Behind yeah. the Blockbuster counter. And remember at Blockbuster, when you would re- return your tape, you just dropped it in that little open wooden chute, right? Mm-hmm. You sure. know, if, you, if the store was open, otherwise it was the mail slot out front if the store was closed and you'd right. drop it in that chute and then I would always kind of linger and see if the guy would pick up the tape because they uh-huh. had a system where they had to open the box, see if it was rewound. Then yeah. if it wasn't, they would scan into the system and you would get charged that fee on your next rental. Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. I would always kind of linger to see if the guy was going to charge me that fee or not. <laughs> I used to kind of linger around the desk with people bringing back tapes because they might bring back something yeah, that they're wanted. out of that I wanted to rent. Oh, like, that's yeah. right. good. Somebody yeah. dropped off some tapes. Do any Jurassic Park's in there? Were any? <laughs> no, dang. Is he in the Jones? No. <laughs> The, uh, oh darn it! Yeah. Have you guys ever made that like late night run to return a movie before you had to pay the late fees? Like, <laughs> oh like, yeah, like two minutes <laughs> yep. before the close, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, when Blockbuster came with the Dropbox, that was like a yep. lifesaver. <laughs> But I can tell you, this would take like two o'clock in the morning. I wake up like, oh crap! <laughs> yeah, it's that's be there right. Before they open, because yeah, be as long open. as it was in there, they were okay, right? Yep. If it was in that yeah. return shoot before they open, as long as it was in the return good. shoot, man. Yeah, some of the some of the fees for late fees were just it's were just stupid expensive. If my car had broken down, I I'm sure I made a half a dozen boxer short, no <laughs> shoes, t shirt right. runs to the blockbuster to make sure they were. Oh, it's three a.m. I make sure it's all room in the slot. If yeah. it broke down, I'd have been out of luck. <laughs> and some of them kind of price themselves out of it too. Like the keeping it the extra day was cheaper than the return fee. Mm-hmm. The late return. I remember yeah, when that right. started happening. Yeah. And so I was just like, well, I know I'm not going to return it on time, but so I'll just keep it for an extra day. And it, so it only cost me a dollar, you know, instead of the two fifty. You just say you're going to keep it. Yep. I had a friend that had a, a movie for so long. He just wound up buying it. <laughs> it was just cheap to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, his fees would have been like twice the amount of the tape. But the guy's like, look, just pay for the tape. They used to call you and go, hey, it's been a few days. You didn't bring this back. Yeah. That's what I was just thinking of. What about one of your favorite movies, John Dodgeball? He's got a recording yeah. at the beginning of the movie when he's brushing his teeth with you who remember because he's just like a total. Yes, slob. Yeah, of course. And he's brushing yeah. his teeth and his answering machine is playing and his answering machine's like, this is video rental store. You've got this oh. porno tape title and this porno <laughs> tape title and Mona Lisa smile. And you're like, what? <laughs> where did that right. come from? Yeah. <laughs> like any good store model that's uh, cranking in money hand over fist, expansion's going to begin. You're both going to oh, make yeah. sure you can keep your market cornered, you know, dodge, duck, dip, dive, a dodge to ensure that you are making the changes the market is changing. So these movie rental stores, they started to expand on what they were doing. So the first obvious one was as VHS started slightly on the way out, DVD was rolling in. Yeah. Yeah. They started to swap out and you had your DVD section and your VHS section and you know, some people had one, but not the other. I remember that vividly. You tended to pay a premium for a DVD at first. As yeah, I they recall. were. You had to pay extra for They DVDs. were more expensive rentals, yeah. Yeah, so if you're upper class than a DVD player. Yeah, but the DVD, at least you know, like, I mean, I'm sure the video rental stores really liked it because they, they really didn't wear out unless people just abused them. I think that's why you could charge the premium because it was a clearer image. It wasn't going to be wrinkled. There was no rewinding. Yay, Yay. no rewinding. <laughs> so the yep. guys at Video One told me that one of the reasons why they charge more for DVDs, aside from the fact that they had to pay more to get the video in the store in the first place, they had to make up all those lost rewind and rental late fees and stuff. So they charge more for the DVDs ah. because of the lost fees too. I remember once on, um, I think it's uh, Think Geek, you know, on their April mm-hmm. Fool's Day, April 1st, they always make these fake products. Mm-hmm. I remember one year that they advertised a DVD rewinder. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's good. And you got to stop and think about it. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> That makes no sense at all. Because you know somebody (laughs) tried to buy one of those at some point. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Even just as a gag. Mm -hmm. The next obvious step, rolling with the uh, industry. And I feel that probably this was partially to expand the business, but partially as movie rental and DVD rental started to slightly fade. Yeah. They're looking for other Almost all the stores started adding in 
video game rentals. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember first renting for the first Xbox, if I remember right, was some of the first ones that I rented out. I mean, they were renting Nintendo stuff and Sega stuff. I don't know if you knew about this, but just like how the studios were fighting rental stores to say, hey, you can't rent our movies, and they won. Nintendo specifically was fighting rental stores say, hey, you can't rent our video games out because we right. we don't sell them for rental. Oh. And they were fighting it and fighting it. And they ended up having a kind of backdoor victory. They It was decided, yes, you can rent them. But Nintendo said, okay, but you may not copy our instruction booklets. That's illegal. Right. This copyright oh. because that was printed material. Right. So that's why you could not get instruction books in there. They might be in there, but they had to be originals. And of course, they would get lost. Huh. Right. Yeah. So they said, fine, you win. You can uh, rent our video games, but we will sue you if you make photocopies of the instructions. Wow. So you couldn't put instruction copies in there. So <laughs> that's Nintendo just trying to hang on to. They wanted to sell <laughs> games just like movie theaters, sure. just like, you know, movie sales studios did. So. Oh, but that was a little struggle they had. But I know I rented a lot of video games from there. Unlike movies, video games were always the cost they were. They cost 49, 59 bucks for a video yeah. game. And if I wasn't sure it was going to be great, you know, I want, I'd like to try this stupid GameCube game, but I don't know if I want to go down to Toys R Us and pay for it. So I'll go up to the movie gallery and go, hey, for three bucks, five bucks, whatever, you can rent it for a week and maybe you'll get everything you need out of it. That's a hell of a Corey system. I got to get right. five hours out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. It's cold and it's damp and there's nothing on TV. A perfect night to cozy up with a favorite film from your 7-Eleven Rent-A-Movie Center. There are over 200 movies and all the latest titles to choose from, and it only costs 99 cents during the week at 7-Eleven. Walking up at 7-Eleven. As with so many things, the gravy train does not roll forever. Heyday, the video rental store started to decline. And I think there were a lot of contributing factors. Yeah. It wasn't just any one thing. Blockbuster totally missed the boat on the whole Netflix mailing in video thing. Because Netflix came in out of nowhere, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could rent a movie. They ship it right to your house. You don't have to go anywhere. They always had like... The latest stuff, like you usually didn't have to wait very long. Blockbuster tried to get in on that action too. They tried to add to your Blockbuster subscription the ability to have them mail movies to you, but it was, I think it was too little too late. Right. Netflix kind of became the de facto. And for those listening, by the way, who are too young, before Netflix was a streaming service, <laughs> Netflix <right>. was a <laughs> website where you go online, create a queue, and they will mail the next movie on your queue to you. You send it back when you're ready in the mailbox yes. with yeah. the postal service. It wasn't always streaming. I think one of the things that kept Blockbuster from doing that early on, they were focused a lot less on innovation and a lot more on promotion. If you remember right, we talked about the blimps in the Blockbuster Bowl, but don't forget there was also the Blockbuster Buster Video Awards. Remember that? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like MTV had their movie awards. They were building this brand that meant movies. Right. They were all about brand building with no substance. And that's something we've talked about in other venues and everything. You can have a brand, but if you don't have the substance there behind it and keep evolving that substance to satisfy your audience, eventually what happened to Blockbuster is going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. I think it was definitely one of those cases where they just thought they were too big to fail. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. they were everywhere, right? And they were making money like on no one's business. So they were never thinking like, oh, we need to innovate to stay on top of things. You know, <laughs> I, I think you're right. I mean, and we keep saying Blockbuster, but I mean, what we're talking in the larger term, we're using Blockbuster as a, you know, like Kleenex means tissue and Xerox right. means photocopier. We're right. talking about the industry when we say Blockbuster. Well, it's movie gallery and your video 21s, a family video, right? So Blockbuster was the only thing that could prop up the innovation of the industry, if you think about it, because after the initial figuring out of we can buy a videotape and rent that videotape out enough times and make a profit, after you're past that part of the business model, the only innovation, the way it could happen is if you have deep enough coffers. Well, the mom and pop stores, even the video 21, could little never have five, done they that. can't, yeah. yeah, they don't have the wherewithal to do that. The blockbusters and the turtles and the movie galleries, those are kind of the chains 
that have to do that sort of thing. And they just simply didn't. Mm -hmm. I think they were all looking at Blockbuster. Those big chains would have had to have been the ones that made the turns and adjusted the market. Everyone else would have followed if there was money in it. I think, Mo, you're right. They just figured, you know what? The gravy train's going to roll forever. No problem. Well, and Blockbuster even tried to counter Netflix a little bit with some of their advertising, if you remember right. Like, sure, there was ads that said, do you really want to just put your DVD in a mailbox? What's going to happen to it? Had like a little thief hamburger guy stealing it out of the commercial. Yeah. Don't you want to come down and see your smiling blockbuster neighborhood employee and, you know, big guy? Oh, look at they that. were trying to solve problems that didn't exist. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, as it turns out, that was incredibly convenient. Yeah. And I know I don't want to drive up to the store. I want to just let it come to me. And when Netflix wasn't the only competitor they had to market, I mean, later on, they had Redbox, right? And that was a huge innovation mm-hmm. that's still there. I still see those in Walmart today. Yeah, they're still around. That's like instantaneous Netflix. You just walk up and say mm-hmm. you want it, you wait for it. You just, it pops it out of the box, instant. Yeah, I mean, the only difference is Netflix sends it to your home. Redbox, it's while you're at your local grocery store or Walmart or wherever. So they're both super convenient. You put those two things together, those are kind of like the last nails in the coffin, really, of the movie mm-hmm. rental store industry. You know, as things were dying in the early 2000s, I will say that I was a notorious vulture picking at the bones of the dying movie rental storehouses. <laughs> I love the clearance sales. Oh. <laughs> going out of business, going out of business, right. everything in this bin, $1. And this is before streaming or big enough hard drives that you could digitize. Mm-hmm. My video library just just explode out of control Expl- because what did you? a movie that you just <laughs> vaguely wanted you know, it's like, eh, I might watch that someday. It's a dollar. All right. Right. They would have bins and bins and bins of stuff, uh, not just movies. You could pick up used video games for next to nothing. Sure. $3.99, $2.99 for a game that was 50 bucks new. And I used to love, like, another one's going out of business. Get in the car. It's going to be a fun day. Right. That was a whole last CPR gas, but you knew it wasn't going to come off that operating table. It was done at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody was liquidating. And, and what are they going to do? It's not like other stores are starting up that's going to buy their used inventory. All they could do is sell it to the public. You know what I bought the most of on the clearance sales at Blockbuster? What'd you buy? The candy and popcorn. <laughs> they were dropping that stuff for like a quarter a piece. It was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah like the guys at the counter, they knew they didn't have jobs for another week so they didn't care they were just like what do you got they in your care, pocket yeah. you got a dollar all right yeah. take 20 boxes of twizzlers there you go everything's 25 yeah. percent off 50 percent off 75 percent off come on in everything had to go <laughs> you want the shelf to go with it take it too we don't care <laughs> they would sell those yeah. too yeah so that was the other thing too is just how quickly blockbuster just disappeared i mean it was fast it, it seemed like overnight almost as quickly as they jumped on the scene they were gone right yeah so it mm-hmm. seems like kind anyway. of thinned a little and you see one close and see one close and then there's like is there one left yeah <laughs> and i would drive i'd visit another city and i'd go oh my god they have a blockbuster they, there's still one open <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they still they have went one. from on every corner like a starbucks to to seeing them it's like oh jackalope i didn't think they were still around <laughs> yeah, you know? and i guess you know we started off with this talking about that they're dead they're still technically at the time of this recording there i believe there's one or three left. I'm not one sure. One more. There's one left. The two one left. In, there's still one more. So the Alaska more. The two, two in Alaska closed. closed. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the one left is in Oregon. One left in Oregon. Right? Yep. Yep. Man. That's right. They started in Texas and they're going to end in Oregon. That's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. I don't see another one opening. Nah. I think you're right. Coming up on 5 Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. Bull Durham, Pet Cemetery, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, big, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Mississippi Burning, Skin Deep, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Blockbuster may have died, but 
those of us who are nostalgia nerds, as I like to say, guilty, we have kind of driven new industries to come back. You know, we talk about there are now album stores that are selling old vinyl LPs because when we were growing up, we mm-hmm. loved vinyl LPs. Well, that same sort of thing is starting to happen with these video rental stores. There are now new takes and fresh examples of the video rental store popping up in cities all across the country. Here in Tallahassee, there's one called the Cap City Video Lounge. What they do is they have Hmm. video rentals just like your traditional blockbuster. You can go and rent VHS. You can go and rent DVD. But then they also have a big screen with a projector and a small, like, I think it's like 30 seat theater style setup. Every now and then they have special events where they run two or three movies back to back and play them of certain genres. Like they had a RoboCop night where they played two or three of the RoboCop movies. And they've had a Freddy Krueger night where they played some of the Nightmare on Elm Street stuff. Hmm. Those kinds of things are starting to become a little bit more popular and they're starting to gain a certain cachet, so to speak. Hipsters love this sort of thing. Yeah. And it makes them feel like they're dignified if they can enjoy old stuff. Yeah, not surprised. I'm not going to say it's ever going to rival the breadth or the size of Blockbuster, but I think it's definitely going to yeah. find a niche in certain cities as somebody takes a chance and says, you know, I remember going to Video 21 or I remember going to Blockbuster. I wish I could do that again with my friends. And that's kind of the feel that these places seem to go for. Hmm, interesting. Now that video rental stores are pretty much all gone. I mean, the, it's, it's changed dramatically, the experience. I haven't walked into one in probably 15 years is the last time I went to one. And, and frankly, it was a clearance sale. I wasn't there to rent anything. I was going to another clearance sale. <laughs> But for many people who might be listening to this who have never been in a movie rental store, it's really just important. The reason we do these backtracks in in general is to kind of preserve and remember what it's like and how it's changed. I'm interested in hearing what you guys think, but I think the video experience as a whole has improved for the advent of digital. Oh, absolutely. It's easier access. Mm-hmm. It's less expensive. While you may miss out on the experience, I'm using air quotes here, of going to a movie rental store, I would argue that that experience is probably something that's not that positive and I don't mind getting rid of it. We got to see some great films. We got to enjoy that cool box art. We got to brush up against the beaded curtain. But all in all, the ability to consume cool content has actually improved as we moved along rather than losing. Would you, what would you say? You agree? Disagree? Yeah, no, I agree with you, except on one point, which is that okay. it's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like the whole thing, like buying a book at Barnes and Nobles versus Amazon. I used to spend mm-hmm. hours in bookstores discovering new titles. I didn't care, you know, wouldn't have normally picked up that kind of thing. Cause as you're browsing, you kind of look at something, you can pick it up, look at it. And we used to do the same thing in the video store, right? When you didn't have something particular you wanted. You're right. Sure. Yeah. You could browse and you probably discover something you wouldn't have discovered before. But now, unless it's, mm-hmm. unless Netflix says, here's another movie you might like, which may or may not yeah, be true. Right. That's the only part I think is missing. But I do agree that in, overall, though, I think the video experience today is much, much better. It's a little bit like the evolution of the car industry. If you were around, which none of us were, when the first Model T was brought off the assembly line, to those people who grew up with that, that was the space vehicle of its time. That was like, wow, you don't have to have a horse and a buggy and all, you know, this thing drives Mm -hmm. itself. You just steer it and spin a crank to get it going. Compare that to like, say, an electric hybrid car today or whatever's going to come out in the next year. It's a completely different experience and you wouldn't have the experience that you have now if you hadn't had that. There would be no Netflix. There would be no online streaming if it weren't for the video store rental industry that started all those years ago. Nobody would have been thinking along those lines of people being allowed to consume the content in the privacy of their own home. Just like with the Model T Ford, you wouldn't have your latest Tesla auto company if it wasn't for Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. Right. It was a place to start, but I agree that it's completely a million times better now. I can still look back on it fondly, I don't have to forget about it, but I'm certainly happier now to just click a button and re- watch whatever I want anytime I want. Yeah, the movie rental stores, they laid the groundwork, they fought the legal battles, and now everyone else can stand on the shoulders of those dead giants. <laughs> Without that bedrock, we wouldn't be where we are. Absolutely yeah. agree. The last time I saw a movie for a dollar, theaters still had balconies for people to neck in. I thought those days were long gone, but then I found out all oh, warehouse movies are now just a dollar a day. We're not talking just one or two movies. We're talking about more movies than anyone else in the world. Now, if I could only just find a balcony. 
If anything in this episode has piqued your interest, we've put links in the show notes you can click on to find out more. Catch up on past shows and be alerted every week when a new one drops by subscribing to us in Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, iTunes, or wherever you like to listen. While in iTunes, take a second to rate and review the show. And if you have a friend who isn't yet listening, why not? Tell them about us. They'll thank you later. We'd love to hear from our fourth listener, so email your thoughts, suggestions, questions, ideas, or complaints on this or any other episode to podcast at genxgrownup.com. And finally, Gen X Grown Up is so much more than just this podcast. You can also find our video content on YouTube or explore our entire body of work on our website at genxgrownup.com. That is about going to wrap it up for our backtrack look at movie rental stores. Before we go, you know, we talked about how we uh, picked at the carcass of the uh, movie rental stores and we got all of our cheap discount VHS and DVDs. And now in this world of video streaming, I want to ask you guys, what's the last time that either of you watched a physical VHS? And then when's the last time you watched a physical DVD? George? The last time? Wow. Um, You remember even? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I can tell you. That speaks volumes. The, the last time that I watched a physical VHS tape was the VHS tape from my wedding. So that's 15 wow. years. Wow, so not even a film. Yeah, I mean. Okay, so over a decade yeah, and a half. DVD. You watch any DVDs anymore? I, I don't really. I still have both VHS yeah. tapes, not just the wedding one, but I have like, my wife was a big fan of the Disney VHS when they would, you know, they would send them out to your home and you mm-hmm. would keep them or send them oh, back. Oh, sure. So she still has right. a ton of those. We still have them. And those have a big aftermarket too. Yeah, so. DVDs I probably have, I don't know, maybe a hundred still laying around here and there. I think if I'm honest, probably about 10 years ago, I think I remember taking DVDs. No, you know what? Five years ago, I remember the current place that I'm working at. I took my public domain Sin City DVD and watch it at work because I couldn't stream <laughs> anything on my work computer, but I can pop a DVD in the drive and watch that during lunch. Mm-hmm. So you can watch a physical. Yep, that's probably the yeah. last time I did. For me, I haven't watched a VHS in, I don't know yeah. how long. I mean, probably longer than your 15 years, George. Uh, and I have purchased DVDs in the recent past, but I haven't watched a DVD. It's like I purchased the old classic Pac-Man Saturday morning TV show, the oh, cartoon, right. <laughs> but I didn't watch it. I threw it in the computer. I ripped it, put it in the library, threw it in the closet. Wow. Yep. So it's a medium by which I'll grab things that I can't stream, but I haven't watched a DVD in uh, at least a decade, at least. So <laughs> how about you, Mo? God, it's... <sighs> Yeah, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> you can tell you that that speaks yeah, volumes. I mean, um, I can tell you the last VHS tape I ever bought, which actually, I reason why I remember this is because I only bought it like a year ago. <laughs> was... Oh, you're not going to say my wedding VHS tape, are you? <laughs> oh, yeah, that one too. Okay. But <laughs> yeah, that's public domain. Okay, domain. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Um, I was in a, uh, a thrift store, and they had an unopened VHS copy of The Matrix. Oh wow! And it was like okay. it was like three bucks. <laughs> and are you so picking I'm it like... up for collector's item or something? <laughs> Yeah, I just picked it up. It's on my shelf. I still haven't opened it. <laughs> I'm assuming it works. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, okay. I was like, oh, a cool it's more movie. of a prop than a VHS. And that movie came right. out yeah, long, okay. ago, long enough ago that it came out on videotape. Yeah, 99 just was when that came out. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty much near the yeah. end. All right, guys. Well, thanks for walking down memory lane with me on Movie Rental oh, Stores. Fun, man. George, thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Mo, I sure appreciate you. Oh, no problem, man. And fourth listener, thanks for going along on the ride with us. We will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye, everybody. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown-up? Gen X Grown-Up is a member of the Evergreen Podcast family. Learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com. No more washing shows till sunrise. Unacceptable for grown-ups. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown-up. If you're doing, uh, what the hell do you call it? God damn my brain today. What is it called? Uh, Just normal day life stuff. Comedy right? where people shout out something. What's the ad lib comedy where people shout? A situation? No. Give me a situation. Give me a... A scenario? A sitcom? A scenario? Sitcom? Scenario? A locale? No, you, you go to a club and it's a kind of comedy where people say, improv? give me a person. Give me... Yes, improv. That's it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Now I can get now I can get back into that. Okay. And three. there's our Easter egg. Ah, oh, damn. It's always me. <laughs> three... Two. I'm Bruce Martin, host of Pit Pass Indy. Each week, I go behind the scenes of the NTT IndyCar series and introduce our listeners to the biggest stars of IndyCar, which features the Indianapolis 500 as its cornerstone event. 
The men and women that compete in IndyCar may be the bravest athletes in all of sport as danger lurks around every corner. They are able to look danger in the eye without flinching. That is why the NTT IndyCar Series features the best racing on the planet. Join me every week as we talk to the stars of IndyCar, including the legends of the Indianapolis 500 on Pit Pass Indy from Evergreen Podcast. 